Hello, welcome to Signposts on Shannon Side, Northern Sound. This week in the hot seat, Mike Mulvey Hill is Anam Dom. Coming up, we'll be hearing from a retired Garda who was the last to live in the barracks in Kesh Carrigan. We'll hear from a lady who recently moved to the area and is an author. We'll also get to meet Yuta from Germany who moved to Kesh Carrigan and is responsible for the setting up of a local singing group. Aiden Tass, originally from Turkey and now the local barber in Kesh Carrigan, will talk to me about his memories playing football for Kiltubra GAA Club. And we'll have live music from Eleanor Shandley, who'll be joined by Eurovision winner Charlie McGettigan. And one or two other surprises between now and the end of this show. Kesh Carrigan by Lynn Reynolds Whispering trees and mirrored lakes, a queue of tiny ducks and drakes, towering mountains guide hills of green as nature paints a wondrous scene. A village small, so charmed and quaint, a cottage white thatched and daint, a coloured splash on window sills, the perfume fragrant air it fills. A grotto sits at the quarry's feet, a row of houses bright and neat. Places for music, drinks and foods, a village shop with lots of goods. Kesh is filled with decent folk, a friendly year, a friendly joke. So don't forget to visit us, make it soon, you know you must. I'm in Kesh Carrigan with Joe Sachs Aldridge and Joe, you're getting ready for the Leitrim Cycling Festival. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So the Leitrim Cycling Festival has been going now since 2017 um, and it's a, it's a wonderful little family-friendly festival that roves around Leitrim. So the idea with the Leitrim Cycling Festival was that it would not only celebrate cycling, but also celebrate communities and celebrate all that Leitrim has to offer. So I set it up uh, after I moved back from the UK because I could see the huge potential Leitrim had for being a cycle touring destination, being a place where families could cycle more often, being a place where people could cycle to work, cycle to see their friends, cycle to um, socialise or to wherever they wanted to go. And I thought that the cycling festival would be a great way of promoting that. So enabling local people to cycle, but also attracting people from all over the country to Leitrim and seeing the potential of of cycling in Leitrim. Now, the festival, the Leitrim Cycling Festival for 2024 is going to be in Kesh Carrigan. And it's going to take place from the 17th to the 19th of May. And... It's significant because that's also National Bike Week. It's National Bike Week and and interestingly this year it's also National Biodiversity Week. So we're going to celebrate all of those things during the weekend in Kashkarigan. It's going to be a fabulous weekend. As always, the weekend starts on the Friday evening. Um, This time I think our launch lap will have a, a special edition and I won't share that yet. And there should be some unusual bikes, some uh, local uh, celebrities and some great music on the launch lap. So we'll have lots of um, firm favourites taking place. We'll have um, the very famous slow bicycle race, lots of family friendly cycles, one of them going looping round the lake with a great picnic stop at Father Michael Judge's garden. We'll take in a great heritage trail combined with a treasure hunt which will be another fabulous family friendly event um we'll have quizzes we'll have talks we'll have uh, ice cream we'll have art workshops there'll be something for everyone at this festival all free all family friendly and all um a wonderful celebration of everything that cash kerrigan has to offer It all sounds fantastic and I know as part of those plans the Kiltubrid Pipe Band are going to be involved in that launch and they're 75 years in existence. Uh, That's going to be a special moment for everybody involved. That's that's right and um, so usually we have a a launch lap of the town that is led by um, music and this year, as you're right, we're going to have a very special uh, 
pipe band to lead the launch lap, which I'm really looking forward to. In the past, for the other festivals, they've come from all over. We've had people coming from New Zealand, we've had people coming from America, we get people coming from all over the country. Um, People are now contacting us early in the year to find out when the dates are so that they can make sure that they make it to the festival. It's become a real event in, in lots of people's calendars and it's great to see it growing each year and seeing more and more people uh, getting a chance to, to see what Leitrim has to offer. And for anybody who's looking to travel, there's also going to be accommodation. There's accommodation um, in uh, Taylor McKeown's pub. There's also a few Airbnbs in the village. And there'll be plenty of camping spots, as always, for both tents and camper vans. I'm delighted now to speak to Maria Hoy. And Maria, you recently, in recent years, moved to Kesh Carrigan. That's right, yeah. We will be here two years now, in the, be- the beginning of June. Yeah, so I don't think we qualify as flow-ins anymore, or maybe we do, <laughs> for the next 20 years. And you like it in the village? Yeah, we love it, actually. We love it. It's um, it's just such a different pace of life. And um, we kind of only realise when we go back to Dublin how you know much more relaxed things are here and um, it's kind of a different concept of time. So, yeah, absolutely love it. And the people are really nice and it's a beautiful place. You know, um, nature means everything to me, so this is just beautiful, yeah. And you were talking about flowers earlier on, you were out gardening. (laughs) Yeah, I've been out gardening uh, today and I posted on Facebook, which I do a lot, uh, probably too much, and everybody in Dublin was saying, oh my God, it's, you know, it's pouring rain here. And (laughs) so Mm -hmm. it's kind of weird. We have some kind of a microclimate here, I think, because it's raining sometimes to the left of us and to the right of us. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice. Well, March is a lovely time of the year because daffodils are coming through and then you're looking forward to tulips and... It's really Actually, nice. Tulips are my favourite flower, as it happens. Yeah, um, I, I just think you know um, nature is wonderful for the for the soul and the spirit, and um, I think that's kind of one of the reasons. I mean, I think I always felt I'd like to live in the countryside. I mean, I grew up in Swords, which is now huge, in North County Dublin. But when I was, you know, when we first moved there, it was a tiny little village. Yeah. Um, my mother always tells me it was a one horse town, you know. So I kind of feel like the countryside is is where. Where I belong so yeah, yeah. It's, it, and this time of the year it's just so lovely yeah now you're a local author as well <laughs> yeah yeah um I I've written three books uh, my first book came out in uh, 2017 and that was published by Poolbeg and it was about a, a missing girl and it was kind of inspired by all the women who've gone missing in Ireland and haven't been found and then my second book was On Bone Bridge and that came out in 2019 I think it was and then my most recent book uh, I actually self-published my my most recent book um, and it is called When They Were Bad and I'm working on my next book now and I'm hoping to find a publisher for that and it's uh, actually on the subject of infanticide in the Irish Free State in the early um, early years of the Irish Free State so it's very different kind of a a book but uh, yeah I love writing and I get a lot of inspiration around here. Yeah and I was just going to say you know how are you finding writing in Leitrim? Uh, it's actually incredible. I, I uh, quite often record pieces as I when I'm out walking um, on my phone. And I used to do that in work and on buses and things in Dublin. And you can imagine that wasn't very, um, what's the word, conducive to like, creativity. So I find I, I go a lot, on a lot of walks here and we have a mad dog, which you just mm-hmm. heard barking there. Uh, so um, I, I find when I'm out and down by the lake or you know i i get a lot of my inspiration then um and i think yeah this place is steeped in history as well and there's an old barracks here which is actually going to be renovated uh, it has actually been um, handed over now for use as a community hall so um that really inspires me because there's actually a barracks in my story in my book so um yeah this place has really given me um sort of food for thought when it comes to my plots you know yeah and you know, when you talk about the content there and what your next book will be about and you look around the area where we are, yeah. you've got Shimor. The 4th oh, of March wow. was yeah. the 103rd anniversary of that ambush and really? the 11th yeah. of March, just gone, was 
the 103rd anniversary of Selton Hill ambush. Wow, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have gotten to know some people here who are very, you know, sort of well up on local history and it just seems to me like there isn't a part of this county where there isn't some, you know, some history. A lot of it is around... Um, you know, obviously uh, wars, civil war or whatever but there's a lot of other stuff too you know, like uh, folklore and my own um, subject matter this time is a huge thing for for women in particular, you know, it was a huge issue. So, um, yeah, I, I really do think that it's it's a very interesting place and there's just so much to discover and I think writers can certainly mine a lot from, you know, from what's around them here. So, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> Maria Hoy, I'm looking forward to reading your thank next you book <laughs> and all <laughs> the best to, to you <laughs> and to Garrett as well. Oh, thank you so much. It's lovely to talk to you. I'm joined now on this lovely programme about Kesh Carrigan by retired Angartha Siakana member John Donahoe. Oh my, how are you? I'm very good, John. <laughs> and good. you were a guard for many years in this village. Yeah, some people say that. <laughs> I came here in um, the, the 3rd of March, actually, in 1977, down from Kinloch. And um, my wife, Susan, and the... Uh, Daughters Kathleen and Nicholas, they were only four and five at the time. And uh, John Paul was born in the... We lived in the barracks, in the actual building down the village there. John Paul was actually born there, the youngest, in 1980. And, um, oh yeah, we had a very happy life there in the, in the village. Like, there was only about 19 people there, I think, up to the year 2000, when all the new houses uh, started being built. And, uh, like, me being a, a rural carry man, I got on very well with the people in the, the locality, you know, and I was into hunting and fishing and that, and I wasn't long getting to know all the farmers, you know, from hunting in that land and that. And um, we had uh, great neighbours, uh, Jimmy Morton in particular. Jimmy, I take him here in the 30s, and oh, he had some great stories, a, a very funny man. Yeah. And uh, you, you wouldn't believe everything he tell you, <laughs> but uh, he was very entertaining. Yeah. You told me a lovely story when you arrived in the village. One of the first things that you had were beehives. Oh yeah, I kept bees for years until I became allergic to them. In the end, if I get a sting from a bee, I'd have to rush into the doctor to get a, an antidote. But when I came from Kinloch, I brought down three beehives in my boat behind the car. And uh, I think there was about 100,000 bees in each hive. Mm -hmm. And, like, I remember well that time. It probably has something to do with uh, climate change now. Every summer I'd be busy taking swarms of bees uh, from the eave gutters of houses and mm -hmm. neighbours all over the place had problems with bees swar swarming, you know, and attaching themselves to, to the fascia board and soffit in the houses. But now you wouldn't see a bee anywhere. Yeah. You know, and, and the honey, of course, was lovely as well. Uh, yeah, I used to work with section honey, you know, the little boxes with the, the wax and the honey in them. Yeah. And that's just beautiful stuff. <gasps> when you oh. were a guard in the barracks, how many other guards were there? Oh, no, my, my time to reduce to a one-man station. Mrs. Lee used to always joke about in her time, her father was a sergeant there, and he had four men. But it, take, it took one Kerry man to replace the, the four men <laughs> that were there before me. Yeah. But, uh, like, it was a real community policing at the time, you, you know. Most things were sorted out at a local level, you know, without resorting to outside help or court cases or anything like that, you know. To, and then nothing ever happened here, nothing major no ever happened here. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, yeah. a, there's a cell in the barracks, even to this day, even though the barracks is now closed, was it ever used? Well, look, just before I came here, the, the whole building was done up and the actual public barracks was um, transformed into the living quarters. And the cell was actually in the living quarters when I occupied it, but it was never used. You couldn't use it anyway. But I never made any arrests when I, when I was here. I didn't have to, really. I'd but, say back then, you know, when we look at the village now, back then what would the population have been well, most of my time were around 19 to 22 or 3 people you know give or take one or two yeah. oh, it was a real quiet rural village uh, 
But and I'd say when the Shannon Earn waterway then was all done, you've seen a huge change. Oh, a huge change from then on. That was in 93, I think it opened. And yeah, it was a big change from then on. But um, like my workload there, Tuesdays and Wednesdays were the two big days. Tuesday you had the signing of the Dole Forums and Wednesday then you had um, social welfare stamps and... and yeah. Uh, other benefits you know yeah and once you were present for those two days you could take leave then for the other days and, and would your work take you far outside the village oh well it's a big sub district actually it went out nearly to Fina and then up to Ohu Cross nearly into Mole you could say and then over to Kilclare like it was a huge big uh, area but I always worked from 9am to 1pm in the office and then at night, 8 p.m. to 12 midnight, to uh, attend to any complaints that yeah. came in during the day, you know. Yeah, I suppose but, when, when I listen to you, you know, and you talk about living in the barracks and raising a family in the barracks, I'm immediately thinking of a John McGahran book that I read. Oh, very, very similar. I read John's book, actually, and I was very friendly with John. I used to visit him and he'd call into the barracks now and again. But John had the way with words, <laughs> and he, he could make up a story about anything. But uh, I know all in all, life was very interesting, and time flew there. You, you know, and like the the workload wasn't wasn't too heavy. But still, you had to uh, account for your movements and that. Yeah. Like the super came every month to check the books, mm -hmm. and then. It took a bit of juggling to get, to get the figures right for him, you know. Yeah. You had a dairy for this and a dairy for that. Like, offences detected went into one book, and then you had a corresponding book with prosecutions, you know, and you had to yeah. balance the two. And, but they were generally okay, all the supers that were in Carrick in my time, you know. They were, yeah. They, they were generally okay, you know. I'd say you were sad the day that it closed. I was retired, um eight years or nine years at the time it closed you know so you could see it coming you, you know mm -hmm. like like the, 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 the countryside had changed and policy had changed as well you know it was a pity really for like you needed the, the community guards you know to keep in touch with people and like I suppose it couldn't go on forever you, you know but you'd still need more contact between the the police and the, the rural populations, you know. Yeah, especially, you know, when we look at it now and we look at the increase in the size of the village and the number of people in the village and to think that there's no Garda station there. I know that there is community policing on a Tuesday where the Garda visit. Yeah, well, it was never more needed than now, sure. You, you don't know who your neighbour is anymore, like, you know. Yeah. You know what? And I suppose the, the history of the building is that it was an old RIC barracks. Yeah, the, you had the courthouse and the barracks there, I think, up until the 1920. I don't know much about the court case now, but uh, it was attached to the building. You can still see the, where it had been attached to the gable of the, the station, you know. John O'Donoghue, thank you very much for talking to us today and lovely to hear your oh, memories yeah, on you the barracks. Uh, yeah, uh, and have a, have a good weekend. Have a good Paddy's Day. So we just heard from John Donoghue and John was the guard in the barracks here in Kesh Carrigan and I'm joined now by the chairman of the Kesh Carrigan Development Association and that's Paddy McGreevy. Hello Mike, nice to talk to you. Uh, you too Paddy and Paddy some great news in the last couple of weeks regarding the barracks. That's correct Mike, uh, two weeks ago we secured a license for the old guard station here in Kesh Carrigan village where we're looking to change it from a change of use from the old Garda station, which has been empty for the last 10 or 15 years, to a development we're going to have it as our new community centre for the community of both the village of Kesh Kerrigan and the surrounding community. The first phase we hope to have planning permission put in now in the next couple of weeks, and phase one should be finished between June and December of 2024, and then phase two, which is the rest of the building in the Garda station, that's a bigger project because um, there's an awful lot of extensive work to be done there. But we are looking forward to the overall project when it's finished. We will have both the community centre and also a working hub where there'll be office spaces and internet uh, facilities and things like that for businesses and people that are working from home. The Garda station here in Kesh Kerrigan is actually a listed building. 
So we had to get a particular architect firm in to be able to deal with the listed building and the procurement of it and also with the design going forward because, as I said, it is a, do- a two-phase project. But um, the aesthetics of the building has to remain the same. It cannot be changed as it is a listed building. So we will secure the help there of Noel Smith there in Belturbet in County Cavan, who is one of these architects that deals with listed buildings. And through Noel's expertise and his help, he has come up with the designs that will be used in the development and the design of the new community centre at the Garda Station. So what other uh, things will you be looking at putting into the community centre along with that? Well, the main the main area would be a, a, like a room, like a, a community room where you could hold um, social gatherings, maybe social dances, something like that, or cake sales, or community projects like uh, Faroiga for the children here in the village and the community, uh, maybe a scout den or something like that, and then a facility then for training, like for CPR training, which I do in the community for the community myself as a, a CFR instructor, and then maybe for local meetings and maybe the pipe band practicing and stuff like that going forward into the future. So we'll say with the village here, there's a defibrillator and I know in the past we've talked and you're looking at finding a new home for it or upgrading its home to a heated model. That's right, Mike. Um, At the moment, we have a phone box here in the village that the businesses in the village have come together and said that they were going to refurbish the phone box first on our behalf and um, the defibrillator at the moment is situated down at the old Garda station. Um, the local businesses of Gertie's Canal Stop, Taylor McKeown's, Northwest Tool Hire in Kinclare and Lynch's their paint over in Kinclare as well. They came together and bought a new defibrillator and heated cabinet box for to put into the phone box. So at the moment we're just calling on all these great carpenters that we have out in the community. Maybe if they got a Saturday for a couple of hours to come down and help us to refurbish the phone box and then we can put the new heated cabinet and the defibrillator into it as soon as possible. Paddy, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. So I'm here with Jane and Stu and you're camping in Kesh Carrigan. This is our camper van Harry, he's called Harry. Yeah. <laughs> and you were here last night. We were how, here, yeah. How how did how did you how did you find it? So we've been travelling in, in Ireland now for uh, eight weeks. Um, we came in at Lawn. It's taken us eight weeks to get this far, so we don't get very far. Um, and we met uh, what was his name? Tony. Tony from uh, I think he works for the waterways and we're up at the is it Bal- Ballinamore 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 yeah. uh, and he and we were happy to be there and he welcomed us and we felt felt very welcomed by him he says oh stay enjoy your stay and by the way there's another place down down the the uh, the, ta- the village here which he's called and I, I, he said there's a couple of pubs down there and he said that it's a nice place down here so we weren't going to stop for an extra couple of days in the area so we have and we've come down we've actually come down and we found that Gertie's is showing the island rugby match as well so we're going to stay an extra night because of that so yeah so we've just come down and just enjoying the the scenery down here well it's a it's a fantastic local area where you yeah. are because you've got Gertie's and you've also got Taylor McKeown's and yeah. both businesses do food and then just outside the village there's a little memorial garden it's the Father Michael Judge Memorial Garden okay. and Father Michael Judge was the first victim from the 9-11 attacks in America. He was the chaplain to the fire service. Right. And he... I know about him. Yes, we yeah. We did a story about him in Waterford. Yeah. There's a, they've got a crystal in Waterford as he was pulling them out. Yeah, he's, it's a very interesting story. Yeah. And he comes from just outside oh, this right. village. Okay. And there's a lovely memorial peace garden. Oh, right, OK. So we'll have exactly. to go there, because we, 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 we sort of go around. We've got a, a YouTube channel, so we do little vlogs and things like our travels and just in Harry, uh, our, yeah. our van. But we, we like the local history, and you just connected a, a dotted line story up to Waterford where we saw the crystal right. father bringing them out of the 9-11 yeah. uh, at the time of the fireman and that. So that, that sort of connects that back up, so we love that. <laughs> yeah, and the reason that there is that connection is because his family came from here and just across the road from where the memorial Memorial Peace Garden is that's the homestead of Father Michael Judge. Ah, right. Okay, we'll, we'll go there tomorrow when we're travelling out. Mm. We'll definitely say that. So we, we pick these things. We speak to people, and we're something we, we don't know where we're going next. Yeah. So we'll we'll definitely go there tomorrow as well. So can you tell us a little bit about 
your social networks yeah yeah so i've been filming uh, for a while since we we got harry and we just got a small youtube channel that we've grown up and it's called getaway geese and we so this is our second tour now of ireland and we just record where we be uh, where we've been so people can perhaps follow or give them inspiration or show them what it's like and that so yeah so we'll, we'll be doing the same thing and uh, creating videos for for this local area as well so yeah so in terms of the local amenities here in Cash Carrigan yeah. County Leitrim, how did you find them? Uh, great. So we've so we've, we've been uh, we're going to go up to uh, Gertie's later. Jane went up there yesterday to see if they were playing. We're going to have a meal up there, and and the local facilities down here are just fantastic. Really quiet, peaceful night last night. Just fantastic views and just peaceful, very peaceful. Well, Jane and Stu, thank you very much That's for right. talking to it's me. Pleasure. And to enjoy the rest of your thank trip you around much. Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. So I'm here now with Aiden Tass. Aiden, you're how long living in Kesh Carrigan? I'm here uh, 14 years. I'm actually originally from Turkey and just came up here and then living here the last 14 years. I'm a, I'm a local barber and kind of hairdresser. <laughs> yeah. And we have just coffee shop as well, just beside the uh, hair shed. We call hair shed. You know, what you've done is you've brought a business to the area Everybody is availing of that business. And I know the first time that I came in, you did, it was a, a Turkish tradition. There was flames involved. Yeah. Scary looking, but brilliant. <laughs> I know people, you know, when they see it first, they'll be scared, like, you know, yeah. the fire on the, you know, flame, and we'll do nose and ear and all that. And then we'll do hot, uh, hot towel shave and all that, yeah. Yeah. And steam the face as well, yeah. We'll try yeah. our best. Oh, we, we'll, we'll have to try that, so we will. Uh, we any Anything to do a bit of an improvement at all, Lighten. <laughs> so, how do you like Kesh Carrigan and uh, County Leitrim? Oh, Kesh is brilliant, brilliant. You know, before the pandemic, we just thought, like, you know, it's so quiet place and, like, middle of nowhere. And then after the pandemic, just like, well, this is heaven, yeah. you know. A lot of people want to go to the countryside and stuff, you know what I'm saying? I think we live in the right part of the country. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> and it was during COVID, you mentioned COVID there, it was during COVID that you would have opened the barbers or yeah. maybe just before, in and around that, and yeah. also the shop as well. And they were much needed things at that time, especially the shop when, you know, people couldn't travel beyond so many kilometres and... To be honest, when we opened it, there was no barbers or no shops in this village. When we opened it, now we have barber and shop and, and there is no barber next town and another town and people are travelling and coming, you know. It's I can brilliant. Good idea yeah. for me, like, good yeah. choice to be open a barber shop. You married a local woman. I am, yeah. <laughs> me, <laughs> married, unlucky man. <laughs> <laughs> You're married to Nicola, so you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I married Nicola, Nicola, yeah. And we have three kids, and lovely three kids, yeah. And enough, yeah. your kids are part of the local exactly. GA club as well, Kiltobrit. Yeah, they are three of them are playing football, you know, GA. They're enjoying them. Like, I'm actually, first couple of years was hard for me now. It's, I'm Irish now. <laughs> yeah, you didn't think about joining Kiltobrit yet, or have you joined I them? Did, I did, I did, I played... Uh, uh, two, three years junior, you know, junior, and I did, I did like it, but just I prefer soccer. <laughs> yeah, how did you like the Gaelic football when you when you were playing uh, it? That was a bit strange when I then learned it and every day, and then you know I learned bit by bit. And yeah. up until that point of playing it, you would have probably seen it and been aware of it. But in Turkey, would there have ever been any talk of Gaelic football? No, when we were when I was working in Turkey years before I came here, and then there was a Gaelic was on TV and they were all laughing at what they doing, they were picking a ball and then kicking it on and you know, yeah. that was strange and then I landed here, yeah, Gaelic is the <laughs> main thing in this country. <laughs> I'm lovely talking to you and all the very best with your barbers and the shop and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted now to be joined on the programme by Yuta from Germany, who recently moved to Kesh Carrigan. Hello, Yuta. Hello to you. And I'm very happy to live in Kesh Carrigan now. So, Yuta, can we ask you, you know, how you came about to be in Ireland? Well, first time I came for a long holiday with my family and four children here in 1989. And then we came every summer here. And uh, I, I've been nearly every year here since, of course, 
COVID stopped it. I've got some very good friends here in Ireland and I always wanted to move to Ireland. Now that my eldest son decided to move here with his family, I had the chance to do that as well and be a granny for my grandchildren here. And how do you like Kesh Carrigan and the area that you've chose to live in? Well, it was very special to me because I didn't know anybody here. When I came first into Kesh Carrigan, I drove from Mohill Road towards Gerties and I thought, my God, what a pretty little village with the old bridge and... Uh, I thought, this is, this is like Hobbit land here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I had my house, all the neighbors were so nice. Yeah, they just took me in as if I was an old friend. Fantastic. And I suppose over your time, you would have got to meet lots of people and there's probably groups that you're involved in. Uh, have you got to know other German people living in the area? Yes, I know a few German people. There is uh, one German family living here in Cash Carrigan as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are a bit around Cash Carrigan, a few yeah. kilometers. And I'm sure where you came from in Germany, it was a big difference coming to Cash Carrigan. Definitely, yes. I'm born in Cologne in a very big city, but the last 46 years I've been living in South Germany near the Swiss border and I was not really happy there. When I came here to Ireland, it was like coming home because the Irish are very much like the Cologne people with their mentality. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're very much involved in the local community as well and you set up a singing group. Yes, that was one of my first things. Actually, my daughter came to visit me and we were in the pub and she said, Mama, would you play a song for me? It was a Monday evening and I said, no, I'm not getting home now, get the guitar. Oh, I do it, she said. And she got the guitar and I sang on a Monday night in Gertie's. And the people who were there said, are you coming next Monday again? So I talked to Des, the owner of the pub, and he invited me hardly to come once the week to the fireside and start a singing group, yes. And I heard from another few people who is good, so I just knocked on the door, for example, for Ofinula, and uh, said, I'm your new neighbor, I heard you're a good singer, would you be interested to start a singing group? And she was delighted. And she was not only a good singer, she was is also a good painter, you know. Um, very artistic village, actually. Then other women joined us, most of all it's women now who come, all my neighbors joined us and uh, one of them who is a fantastic singer is Lynn Reynolds and she is on top of that a poet. Would you mind if I introduce one poem yeah, of that, hers? that would be lovely, Yuta. Okay, I do that because he has a lovely spring poem here. A beautiful spring day in Cash Carrigan. The wind at my door, it whistles and whirls. The tulip on my window, it dances and twirls. The cherry blossom all clad in pink, awash with Mother Nature's ink. The sun decides to make a move, its light, it beams in every groove. The warmth, it calmly soothes the land, abruptly slapping winter's hand. Tiny buds are popping up, the primrose charm, the buttercup. The birds, they hum a brand new song to sweetly welcome spring along. Absolutely beautiful and perfect for this programme on Kesh Carrigan. Thank you for reading that, Yuta. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure. I mean, Lynn is also a fantastic singer and we have other good musicians there. We are missing still some other people with instruments. I myself play the guitar. Now we've got another girl with a guitar there, but it would be great if other people would join us. We meet once a week on Tuesday evenings in Gertie's from eight till 10, and we sing all kind of music. But it would be great if other people would join us, especially we would like male voices there. I don't know if they don't dare to join mm -hmm. us because it's all women. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, it's lovely to hear about that and hopefully people who might play instruments in the village or want to do some singing that they'll go along the next time. Yeah, that would be great. We would like an accordion and tin whistles and bow runs and everything, whatever you have. And if you are a good singer, you are welcome. And if you are no singer, you are welcome as well. Because we always like to have people there. Not everybody is a good singer, but you can join into the chorus all the time. Yeah. We are not a choir uh, who has to be perfect. Yuta, thank you very much. Thank you. Father Kieran McGuinness, you're the new priest in Kiltobrit. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, away from Ireland nearly 50 years. And it's great to be back, especially in Leitrim. And uh, after many years abroad, many changes obviously have taken place here. But it's a very vibrant and welcoming community. And we have great plans for the parish here. Now, when you were on the missions, what part of the world were you in? I spent uh, most of my life in Africa, mainly in northern Sudan. And, uh, of course, what Africa always is, it's a place where the youth are there. So the churches were always full of young people. And uh, because of that, are always very vibrant and young people always want to express themselves. And uh, Africans and Sudanese always great musicians, people who sing well, sing loudly, and sing with all their heart. So when you have a celebration of Mass there, it was always a great, wonderful thing to see. When you came here, there's a lot of unsettlement, we'll say, around the world at the moment, and a lot of people who are now living in the area, and I'm thinking of people from Ukraine and places like that. Yeah, it's, it's a completely, it's, it's wonderful to see all these people from various places that they've found a home in Leitrim and that they feel at home here and that they are welcomed by the people. And uh, it shows that the world is unsettled but that Ireland is always this place of Cade Mila Falls. You're welcoming people always. And uh, it's really good to see that. Now, one of the things that I noticed since you became priest here at Drum Kong was you brought back altar serving, but also you're open to a choir. Yeah, of course, as I said, you know, in Africa and elsewhere, choirs are a very important part of praying, you know, as one of the great saints, I forget which of them said, to uh, sing is to pray twice. So it's great. And Ireland is famous for singing, and Leitrim especially, in this area, with mu music is oozing out of the place. So <laughs> it would be good to have a choir in the church and that people would sing, express themselves and help each other to pray in a good way. So I'm hoping that a choir, and already there are good signs of it, people are quite keen, so we hope it will, it will, it will develop. Father Kieran McGuinness, lovely to speak with you. Thank you very much, it's a great pleasure. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Let's turn to a little bit of sport now, and James Gill is with me to talk a little bit about the works which have been ongoing at Kiltubra GAA Club over the last couple of years and the place is looking great yeah it's a massive it's a massive achievement to everyone uh, like involved there over the last so many years like uh, with the new surface the playing surface that we have now and and, 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 and the lighting that was installed there years ago it's it's and, and there's works going on the whole time and it's just a massive uh, achievement by all the all the supporters all the parents all the all the people around the village just and 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 the club just helping out at the moment now so it's a huge buzz when you look at the setup today, you would have come up through all the age ranks at the club from the very beginning. Yeah, I I, I would have kind of broke onto the 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 scene back uh, coming up with the underage titles there with, with Pori Kelly. So there would have been a few of us, myself, Shane Foley, the likes of Aidan Bohan, uh, Niall Foley, Mickey Early, and we would have. Uh, one kind of underage, uh, under 16, a uh, minor, and then the whole, that whole group of lads, uh, broke through onto the first team, which was a huge learning curve to, to, uh, get up to the likes, with the experienced lads, the likes of Conor Doherty, Noel, Gill, um, 
Jerry Winters, uh, Christy Carr, Barry Doyle, all them kind of more experienced first team players. So it was a huge kind of learn, like learning curve for that. Like you know, so it was good back then. Like yeah, when you mention names, there like you've just mentioned, the first thing that comes to my mind is two thousand and five, the county final. A lot of those names would have featured in that team. Yeah. It, to be fair, yeah, there was there was a there was a good mixture there of youth and kind of experienced players. Like, um, like back in two thousand and five, we had a a great management team with Sean Hag and Miguel Tai and Pat McQueenie back then. Like, and that was that brought that brought uh, like a a professional setup, if you like, uh, to the likes of Kilcover, which was badly needed over the years. Like, you know, and and that kind of gave us the extra push. James Gill, thank you. No problem, Mike. So you never know who you're going to bump into when you're in Kesh Carrigan and Mike Banahan has just arrived and Mike, you're part of a group putting together Festival Folk yeah. which is going to take place in Roscommon. That's right, where we're putting Festival Folk together. This is our second Festival Folk. Uh, we had one last December so we're putting on one for Easter uh, with Charlie McGettick and Eleanor Shanley, Mick Hanley and Leo Logan all under the same roof on the same night in the Abbey Hotel in Roscommon. So it's going to be a it's going to be a good night and a good variety, and it's nice to see um, these different artists perform individually, but perform together as well. So that's where the nice surprises come when they come together as duets or even all together for like a finale at the end. You don't get that opportunity in, at other concerts if they're playing solo gigs, but this is where you get that opportunity when they're all playing together. Yeah, it's a fantastic lineup, yeah. so it is. And Eleanor, you were involved in the last Festival Folk, which took place in December. I certainly was, and we had a ball. And I'm actually really looking forward to this one because it's all people I know and I've worked with and I've loved singing with, the fabulous Charlie McGettigan, the fabulous Mick Hanley, and of course, Leo Logan. And I uh, spent some time in Leo's studio before Christmas with my niece there and she got a beautiful single and he did amazing work on it. But I've worked with Charlie for many years and recorded his songs. And so it's just, I'm so looking forward to the night. I worked in Folk Through Session with Mick Hanley for a couple of years and uh, sung with him as well. So it's going to be a mix and gather and it's, it's going to be great fun. It really is. And Charlie, you're on the bill as well. I've worked with Eleanor, you know, going back, um, Janie Mack, when she was about 16 or 17 years of age, uh, I first heard Eleanor uh, through, through the lovely Tony McGowan, who really would appreciate great singing. And he, he met me one day and he told me, we've got a better singer than Joan Baez up here, you know, in, in the school. The thing about Eleanor is she's very popular abroad, particularly in Denmark. I remember doing a, a concert at the Tuner Festival. Now, you're talking about 25,000 people would be at this festival. And uh, the first night we arrived, we arrived, the, the plane, somebody's base got lost. And we arrived and had to get a second plane. We arrived on the stage and I didn't really know what to expect. And we stood up and Eleanor got five encores. Was that, you know, can you imagine 25,000 people uh, clapping and they, they do a, a slow hand clap. And yeah. I, that here, that would be a kind of a, a derision. It was a bad thing. But there, it's to show their appreciation. And I thought we wouldn't get off the stage. It was just amazing. And then, of course, we we worked all over Europe. We were in Germany. We were in Belgium. I remember it. We went to Ypres on a day out. There was a picture on the wall of Ypres as it was before the First World War. Then there was a picture of it afterward. It was just flattened, literally flattened. And they reconstructed Ypres, I remember, to the to, to in exactly the same way that it was before the war, which is an incredible kind of experience. But we we play with all kinds of famous people, didn't we? You know, the, the, and we just had just a wonderful time. You sang for a queen, Queen Margaret, was it? Yeah, yeah Mar I'll, let, I'll let Eleanor tell you about it. Queen, it was uh, Tuner, the same place that had the festival. They were having a hundred hundred and fiftieth uh, anniversary of the town. And I sing a song called Maggie, Sean O'Casey's Maggie. And uh, so they invited us over to perform for Queen Margaret, who's just retired. Actually, I thought I'd be in with a chance for the job, but she gave it to <laughs> one of the sons, I think, or something. But um, yeah, we had a ball. She sat down underneath, smoking her head off. There was no um, kind of pomp and ceremony. It was just very natural and lovely. And she's just a lovely lady, you know, but she has that reputation in Denmark as well, being a very ordinary, down to earth person. Well, I could tell you, I could tell you stories, but I don't oh, know don't whether tell I'm going to. You know, um, I know, but should I? Should I? No, Will I? Therefore, my 
book. Well, the funny, the, the funny thing, there was um, Eleanor's mum, sadly, no longer with us. She was such, such a wonderful and a great supporter of Eleanor's. And any time we were playing anywhere close at all to Kesh, she'd come along. But when Eleanor began to get a lot of international attention, I remember the, the, one of the promoters who was booking us uh, for a, somewhere in Europe, I can't just remember, it could be Germany, and he rang up um, uh, Eleanor's house and um, he says, I wish to speak with Eleanor Shanley. Uh, well, no, you can't. She's way over the fields after cattle. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and, and he told me this, you know, and he didn't really understand what she meant. But, you know, we, we, we do. <laughs> What's she doing way over the hills after the cattle? <laughs> and so, Eleanor, we're here in Kesh Carrigan yes. today, so we are. And you're, you're from, my home you're from, from here. Home, my this absolute. is your nick this of the is, woods. This is my comfort zone, my the love of my life, Kesh Carrigan. Absolutely, uh, born and reared here. Uh, I love the place. I love the people. I love the landscape. I love the music. Um, I grew up with all of that. Um, and Charlie will tell you in a minute about our wonderful St. Patrick's Day parades but I grew up with uh, you know music my mother's family were all singers and I'd hear like, my mother singing around the farm and then there was a woman down the village Sissy Shanley and Sissy used to go out on the bicycle and spend the day on the Long Acre with the cattle graze and then she'd be leaning on the bicycle chatting away to the cattle and she'd be there I like you today no I don't like you you're bold today and all these cattle had personalities which they do have Yeah. but Sissy was a beautiful singer and I remember her clearly she used to sing Teddy O'Neill and she used to sing uh, Only a Bunch of Violets and I used to love hearing her sing Yeah. she had a really sweet voice and all of that is still in my head and in my music that's what I've carried with me and it's all from Kesh Carrigan from my mother's family from the people around from the area and is it those days you know listening to those songs being sung on the long acres that what brought you into music a hundred percent yeah and I remember coming home from school singing for my mother and funnily enough the song I was singing was my own lead from home and she heard me and she says gosh you can sing so then I was marched in to sing at the Toast Lindrum Chambo yeah where I won first prize. Oh. <laughs> I actually, do you know what I have at home? I have the little yellow adjudication slip. Paddy Tony was the adjudicator. Oh, from Donegal. Yes. And he said uh, on, on it, this little girl can fill a room with no microphone. Yeah. And uh, that, I was about, I think, eight or nine at the time. Yeah. But uh, that that was, the, all my influences came from that area, for sure, my musical influence. From and that's, that's so true. I, I remember not all the places that we played in Europe were glamorous places, you know, and we'd be playing sometimes, you used to do three sessions a night, you'd do, do three 40-minute se sessions, and, you know, people would be talking, there was bar and lots of noise, but the one thing, the one song that silenced the place was your version of uh, of uh, Raglan Road. Like, the, literally, and this she would do it with no... Amp no um, musical instrument or anything just sang it totally solo and the place would go silent just like that amazing and that was so when you said that this yeah. voice lady can fill a room you've just you know. reminded me I haven't sung it for a while I must stick it back in the repertoire oh, it's a great one to do <laughs> maybe we'll do it in on the, on the 28th of March yeah. but going back to Patrick's Day festivals um, the legendary Desi Foley when you, you, you could not talk about Pat St. Patrick's Day festivals without mentioning Desi and Desi had very unusual festivals he had one uh, called the Walking Backwards Festival so everybody had to walk back including the band uh, uh, and the other one was the Invisible Festival and yeah. people turned out there was hundreds of people standing and Desi was there now look at that Ben that Bengal tiger there that's the, the stand back woman or he'll bite you right. you know and look at the, there's the elephant look at the giraffe look at this and people were going looking around <laughs> no shame there was a woman beside me and, and uh, you know he was, there was a, they had a big truck kind of with a, uh, somebody announcing all this this parade like Boris Yeltsin and all these people were in the parade and this woman turned around and she says should this is ridiculous Should there's nothing here at all <laughs> 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 you know, talking about uh, at the Toastal, I remember at one Toastal, there was a, a Bee Gees tribute band on, you know, and there were a great, great crowd out and everything. And I was walking up behind, there was these two women, and one of them said to you, do you know, 
I don't think that was the Bee Gees at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the wonderful thing. You know, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Eleanor, uh, lovely to have you here. Mike Banahan as well from Festival Folk. It's on the 28th of March at 8pm. Uh, Charlie, you've brought along the guitar and Eleanor's going to sing a lovely song about Kesh Carrigan. Written by John Ryan, a lovely song about Kesh Carrigan. And uh, before I go, Mike, can I just mention that through the summer in the Mike Harn Lodge in Balnaslow, myself and Mike Hanran are hosting a series of concerts. So it'll be every couple of weeks we'll have a concert and people will find out more mycarnlodge.ie or eleanorshanley.ie so we'll be bringing guests in you'd never know who we might have in that right, <laughs> <laughs> if the money's right we go anywhere yeah, there you <laughs> well Eleanor thank you very much for talking to us today and thanks Charlie for coming along thanks as well you, and Mike. Mike as well uh, really looking forward to going out on this song Kesh Carrigan I was just a little child of barely three or four When first I saw the world beyond She began dark, she more A shining place of wonder Well, that's how it looked to me From the little hills that rise above Kesh Carrigan Some of us are born to stay, but I was born to roam. With great invention on my mind, I took the rocky road to find this job of journey work, though it takes me far away from the little hills that rise above Kesh Carrigan. Oh, my heart lies there Where the gentle waters flow And the heron, she flies homewards On wings so wide and slow And that's why at times You'll find me quiet Counting down the days Till I walk again The hills above Kesh Carrigan Well, I'm okay till I hear somewhere a lonely piper play. That lovely air, she begs, she more, and I get swept away. I'm floating in a shining place, and somehow looking down on that little Leitrim town they call Cash Carrigan. Oh, my heart lies there Where the gentle waters flow And the heron, she flies homewards On wings so wide and slow And that's why at times You'll find me quiet Counting down the days Till I walk again The hills above Kesh Carrigan's